on the do's and don'ts of Power BI relationships. Uh, I'm Peter Myers, so I'm your presenter, and I have worked for many years in business intelligence and working with modeling. Uh, and I'm also an instructor, so I get to see students at different levels, whether they're entry level, intermediate, or advanced, and I just see so many different problems. And what I detect out of these are patterns on how to solve them. And so I've put together this presentation that tells you pretty much what relationships are, what does work and works by design, and what are some common pitfalls and things perhaps you shouldn't do. Okay, so the session outline is we'll cover what Power BI model relationships are, and then we'll switch straight into practice. You know, through demonstration, I'll enforce the key theory of the do's and don'ts. So how about we start with the topic of perhaps what you shouldn't do. So here you see Power BI Desktop, and I've imported some data representing some sales activity, and we end up with a single table named Sales Extract. This is quite common, in fact, because some systems export a denormalized CSV file, and the temptation is, let's just go and import it as is and start building our reports on top of it. And while that may work to some degree, it certainly isn't friendly, it's not well organized, and as your data volumes grow, uh, it becomes inefficient and um, not optimal. Next is that as you start to build more complex expressions for your measures, it becomes increasingly difficult when they're all columns of a single massive table. So that is the bad experience, and I'll kick off my demo by doing the right thing here, putting it in the trash can. <laughs> so let's talk about some theory to back up what good modeling is. what a good projection is. The problem up front here, it's very dark and I need a candle <laughs> or something. <laughs> there we go. Do we see that? Awesome. Okay, so modeling relationships. What are these relationships? So what we need to appreciate is that as a tabular model design, we typically have more than one table, and tables, when we apply filters to them, are designed to propagate filters to others. So the key takeaway here is that these model relationships that we're about to talk about in great detail in this session are there to propagate filters to other tables. So what does this mean? Let's see by example. I have a sales table with simplistic information like a product key, a year, and a quantity, and in the same model, I have a product table, and you can see the first column of the product table has a unique column of product IDs, and we establish a relationship between them such that when our visual in a report asks, what is the sale quantity of product B, the filter propagation works like this. Filter on product B, propagate those down to the sales table, and then it will sum the values of 10, 5, and 2. Now, as a variation of this, we might have another table where category filters to product and product filters to sale, enabling us to ask a question at a higher level. What were the sale quantities for cat A? And there you can see the propagation of filters. There are two products for cat A. The related sales gives us a result this time of 14. Well, guess what? We could have other tables, this time a date table or year. And so what we'll do is ask the more increasing question when it comes to filters that what were the sale quantities for cat A in 2018? And this is how it works. That at the intersection of those two filters, it reveals there's just the one row, so the answer in this case is 11. And so pretty much when it comes to filters in your models, it's a variation on this design. And I'll point out at this stage that you'll see that those relationships have a one and a many side, the asterisk. And this is a very common design pattern, and we'll talk about variants on it today. So good model design should strive to deliver the right number of tables and the right relationships in place. And for those that have data warehousing background with star schema, this is typically those that have developed or worked with data warehouses, which by the way, isn't the immediate target audience for Power BI Desktop. It's the business analyst that likely uses a data warehouse but never designed them, never had to think in terms of fact tables and dimension tables. But if you can adopt some of this theory, it goes a long way to assisting you in designing an optimal model in Power BI Desktop. Do note that relationships are not concerned with referential integrity, so there is some confusion from those that come from relational background 
that foreign key constraints, in a diagram we see them as relationships between tables, but their purpose is very different. Although commonly where you have a foreign key constraint enforcing integrity across tables, they're likely to become relationships if you have those tables in your model. And the other thing I'll say is that this is not an exact science that the decision of the tables and the columns and the relationships you establish, there could be many ways to solve the same problem. So there's a balance there between science and art. All right, so a quick background for those that don't have star schema. We have the concept of a fact table, and why it's called a star schema is that the points of the star, if you can use your imagination, are what we call dimension tables. So in this case, if anyone recognizes the database, where did this diagram come from? The AdventureWorks data warehouse. As an instructor and demonstrations, it's been incredibly useful over the years. Well, let's understand what the purpose of the two different types of tables are. This is a word-heavy slide, so let me summarize it. Dimension tables are there to describe your business entities, the things that you're modeling. And when you listen to the requirements for your model, you're listening for that two-letter word, by. I need to see sale quantity by year. I need to see it by category, by product. And when you hear that, it tells you that in your model, you'll need a table and you'll need columns to support that. All right, so essentially dimension tables describe your things, including time itself. And when it comes to the analytic queries that Power BI will execute on your behalf and visualize in reports, dimension tables support two things, filtering and grouping. Now the fact tables, they represent an accumulation of your business activity sales, temperature readings, budgets, you name it. The purpose of fact tables are to deliver measures or summarization of data. So in an analytic query, there are three distinct phases, to filter, to group, and achieve summarization. And so I'd start asking you to think that your model design needs to have tables that map to this. Tables that are dimension tables, for filtering and grouping, and relationships across to fact tables that will achieve summarization. So when we have a look at Power BI and the objects within a model, there is the table itself. More often than not, that table arrives in your model because you have a power query that when applied loads data into your model. And there are properties that we can configure like the name of the table, the description which might appear as a tooltip in the fields pane. Um, more recently, we've seen a storage mode property like does it represent import data, direct query, or both? And then a property called table role. Is it a dimension or is it a fact? And I've just made that up for impact. There is no such property in a tabular model that declares that that table is a dimension table or a fact table. Those terminologies do not appear anywhere inside Power BI Desktop. When we have a look at the relationships that we'll establish, let me get the theory out of the way now. Those relationships take place between two tables from one column to another column. There are no multi-column relationships. There are no self-referencing relationships back to the same table, so it's as simple as that. One column in one table must propagate filters to another column in a different table. The properties then consist of what is the cardinality? One to many, many to one, one to one, many to many. So you have all four possibilities of one and many. Filter direction, single or both. Um, does it apply security filters? Um, we won't see that in demo, but if you're enforcing row level security, you might enable that property to ensure filter propagation enforces row level permissions as you expect. Is the relationship active or not? We'll explore this. And does it assume referential integrity, which is only a direct query model design? Therefore, the queries sent to the underlying source will use inner joins rather than outer joins. And note that there can only be one active path between two tables in the model. And I'll describe this in demonstration. It'll make much more sense. It is the cardinality property then that determines the role that your table plays. We don't have a property that declares a table as a dimension or a fact, but which side of the relationship with the cardinality will determine whether it's filter group behavior or summarize behavior. So with that new knowledge, if we took that star, we would see this pattern. The one side is always on the dimension table side. You will have a column containing unique values like the product stock keeping units. And as we'd expect in a sale fact table, hopefully 
your business is successful enough that you sell the same product more than once, right? So obviously on the fact table side, the product column will contain duplicates. Very common pattern to see. All right, I'll just introduce up front that in the DAX function library, there are some functions dedicated to working with relationships, and I'll demonstrate as many of these as I can within the time I have for this session. Uh, at the bottom of the path functions, I'll mention them right now because I won't demo them. While there isn't a capability to have self-referencing relationships, remember, relationships between two different tables in the model, if you do have that characteristic in your data, typically used to generate a parent-child hierarchy, like an organizational chart of employees, general ledger structures often conform to this, you can use the path functions to help naturalize these into columns and then build a fixed level hierarchy. There is no such concept of a parent-child hierarchy inside Tabula. Are we ready for some good modeling? That's all of the theory as it stands, but now it's time to see the application of that. All right, so where it begins is, I have a Power BI desktop file. I've just deleted a table that was not up to scratch. Um, and the very first thing that I'm going to do is come to my file options because there are some properties and options here under data load that are specific to relationships. All right. And you'll see that it will import them if it detects them as foreign key constraints in your source or the other option there is it might auto detect them and create them for you automatically. But that's not a lot of fun. Okay, it's more educational for me to do it rather than have it do it on our behalf. So I don't suggest that you turn these off, but in demonstration, I'll start that way. And having done that, it's now time to bring in some data into my model. And I'm deliberately keeping the data really simple. This company doesn't sell a lot. It has three sales transactions, so here we see a fact table of sales. So just to become acquainted with the data, each sale has an order date, ship date, a stock keeping unit for the product, the manager's first and last name, the sale quantity, and the sale price. So I will use trusty Power Query to connect to that Excel document. And there's the sale data. And we'll just bring it all in. There's just one thing missing. We need to analyze sales, so I'm going to take that quantity and multiply it by the sale price and produce a column that is the product. So that will become my sale amount. Next, we have some product. So the product, in fact, comes from a different source. In a CSV document, I have the products. Very simple just the four products, so there's a single transformation I need to do here, and that is promote the first row's headers. And you see that we've got a unique column of stock keeping units, and then we see that we have a product and it's assigned to a subcategory. Now, there happens to be categories as well, but they come in a different file. So I'm going to go back to Excel and find that I've got a subcategory workbook, and this workbook allows me to map a subcategory to its category. But wait, there's more. The list price of a product isn't contained in either of those documents. So for the list price, I need to come back to Excel, and we'll find that for each product, we maintain this in a separate document. So for each stock keeping unit, we see its list price. And yet there's more. So contained within a CSV document, I have my managers. Remember, managers are assigned to sales. All right, so I'll bring these in, and I'll apply a transform to use the first row as the columns. Now, take a close look at this. Something a little interesting. It's not just describing managers, right? We have their first and last name and an email address, but the last column actually introduces another dimension that there is some association between a manager and a subcategory. And for that reason, we see that, is it Fred or B, 
um, actually is assigned to two subcategories. So that relationship we're going to refer to as a many-to-many, -many, that managers are assigned for performance reasons. When it comes to analyzing their performance, they're assigned at a subcategory level, and they can be assigned to one or more. So as a many-to-many, -many, we could interpret that, that a subcategory can have multiple managers assigned to it, and it works the other way. All right, that the categories can have multiple managers. So this is not in a state ready to load. Okay, I really need to focus on single dimensions, not load them together. And so what I'm going to do is rename the query as manager raw. Okay, and I'm going to disable the load of it, and then I'm going to reference it in a new query, which I'll name manager. And this gives me the opportunity to then remove the subcategory, remove duplicates, and there is my list of managers. I will take this opportunity to introduce the manager as a full name. And now I have five queries uh, that represent uh, the subject area. So I'm just going to go ahead and apply those power queries. And now the model is born. Each of those enabled queries becomes a table in the model. And switching back to Power BI Desktop then, I'm going to use the model designer to sort of lay these out in a logical way. And I'm thinking star schema. There's my fact table in the middle. I see product to subcategory. I can see list price here and manager here. No relationships auto detected because I turned that off. Now, critical to all model design is to have a date table. So I will go ahead and create a calculated table to deliver date. And so I can achieve that on the modeling ribbon with a new table. And the date will simply equal the calendar auto function. So I'll keep this conversation short, but this function will deliver a full year ranges of dates encompassing what is already loaded into the model. Remember, there are two date columns in the sale fact the order date and the ship date. And then I'm going to enhance this with additional columns like year. Okay, so in recognition that I heard that by word used, that sometimes we need to filter or group by the year of the sale. And so there I have the calendar year column. And I'll just add one more, which is the month. And I'll use the format function here to format the date value using the yyy-mm. The last thing that I'll do is mark that as a date table, and I am good to go. And then I'll switch back to the model diagram, and we'll see that the star schema is taking shape with our fact table in the middle. All right, before I go ahead and create any relationships, I do like to demonstrate what it looks like when there's an absence of relationships. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and create a table that says, okay, let's have a look at the months and we want to know what the sales were that were achieved in those months. And when you see this, um, you might scratch your head and think, well, that's just a coincidence. And maybe it is. What do you think? That we happen to have sold $15 worth of sales every month. Does that seem reasonable? Well, come on, of course it isn't, because we've just seen that there are only three facts in this table. When you see a repeating value, and, and, a, and a big giveaway is this, even the total comes to 15. There is no filter propagation taking place. That visual is asking for a group by year and then sum of sales. The absence of propagation says you're getting the total of all sales for every year. Let me go ahead and open up the Manage Relationships window, go ahead and create a relationship from the sale table down to the date table, mapping order date to date, and just click OK. And I like doing it this way because you see instant validation that, aha, now that's making sense. The easier way, though, to create relationships is typically to use the drag-drop approach. From the many side to the one side. So what do I have here? I have stock keeping unit, drag-drop to stock keeping unit. Subcategory, drag-drop to subcategory. Stock keeping unit, drag to stock keeping unit. And now I'm stuck. Manager doesn't provide me a single column that I could relate to the sale. And this is where I need to go back to my data preparation phase and rework things. 
so I'll open up Power Query. And I have the manager table here. The answer, of course, in a data warehouse would be to do what? Surrogate key, thank you. So we just want a unique identifier as a single column. Um, so here in my manager query, that's easily solved by coming to the add column ribbon, adding an index column. In this case, I'll choose a, a one-based index. Rename this as manager key. I'll update the data type to a whole number. And that fixes up the dimension side. I now have that one column. Uh, but I need to give consideration to how it's going to relate to sale. OK, so here I'm going to perform a merge. A merge uh, the sale to the manager. Now, this window looks so remarkably like the manage relationship window. It is not the same concept. One column relating to one column. Here, this is actually merging two queries together based on common columns or columns. We can multi-column join here. So I'm pressing the control key, and I'm selecting first name, then last name, and pay attention to order matters in the way that they're going to map. Okay, and then I do the same thing down here, first name and last name. So this is integrating two queries together. Remember, they come from different sources. And then I'm going to introduce simply the manager key. And now that I have manager key in the sale query, now's the opportunity to remove these two. So let me go ahead and apply. And now I've satisfied the requirement for that relationship, that there needs to be a one side and a many side in the data. And then it's just a matter of dragging manager key to manager key. A star is born. Okay, well, let's give it a test drive. We've already seen here that we've got monthly sales. Now, what's going to happen as our business becomes more and more successful? And, you know, we, we sell some more things. So in April, we sold the same thing, and maybe we did it again. Just making up some data. Save. Come back to our model. It's time to refresh. We're getting an error. Something isn't right. And we could read the message, but time doesn't really allow. Let me tell you what's going on. Take a close look at the relationship specifically to the cardinality. One to many. One to one. That one we know is OK. There's a list price for each product. But here is the problem. A one to one. And when you see a one side pointing to a fact table, something isn't right. What you're dictating in your model design is that you can only ever sell that product once. And I'm not sure how long you'll remain in business. OK, now the reason that the, the drag drop technique let us down was that there were unique columns in both sides. Like Power BI understood what was in the column. So it just said, OK, unique, unique. It must be a one-to-one. -one. So it requires me in two instances to come and double click that relationship and say, actually, no. That is a many-to-one relationship, and I only want a single filter direction. We'll talk about this in more detail shortly. And then date had the same problem. We had unique dates on both sides. So I'll switch this to a many-to-one and back to the default of single filter. Now let's go ahead and see if I can refresh that cell data. OK, we have success. So the point about this is the fact table will always, as we can see here, be the many side of those relationships. OK. Well, let's take a look at some DAX functions. So I have some snippets here. And the first one I'm going to do is demonstrate the related function. So there are a family of functions, related and related table, that navigate relationships. So this one here is going to create a calculated column on the sales table. And navigating in the one direction of the relationships, it's going to add a column that is the category of the product that was sold. Now, you really shouldn't do this, because we already have this data in the model. The way we'd achieve knowing category sales is to filter by category, let the propagation filter the sale table, then achieve the summarization of it. But just for demonstration, the related function, in fact, has traversed over two relationships, from sale to product, continuing in the one direction to the subcategory table. Don't do this at home, guys. So I'll go ahead and delete it. 
The next one's a little more interesting because still using the related function, it's doing this, that the discount amount is, for whatever the product is, go and get its related list price, multiply by the quantity, and subtract the sale amount. Logically, any difference means there must have been a discount applied. So that is a valuable column for the analysis that we know that we're going to do. All right, get the related list price and then generate any difference. I will keep this one. And let's just take a look from the subcategory side that I could also use the many direction, and that's what the related table function does. So on the subcategory table, let's count the number of orders that each of those subcategories has achieved. Related table returns a table, so we need to summarize it, and the count rows counts the rows of that table. Again, you should not do this. You should not increase the size of the model by adding these unnecessary columns that can be easily evaluated at query time. So I will delete it. But now you've been introduced to the related and the related table functions. All right, switching back to the model, um, let's pay attention to this one-to-one -one relationship. So while there is support for one-to-one, -one, I don't use it. Uh, the reason for this is that I like to keep my fields pane and the tables as well organized as possible. I don't want too many tables is where I'm heading. So if there's truly a one-to-one -one relationship, well, let's just take those columns and consolidate them into the product table. So back to the query editor. I come to product and I merge queries and I merge from the product list price relating stock keeping unit to stock keeping unit. I then introduce the list price. And then importantly, I disable the load on the product list price because I no longer need that data in the model itself. Yes, I'm prepared for that table to disappear from the model, and we'll go ahead and apply those changes. All right, all should be okay, except, of course, there was a dependency that this measure, or rather this column, was referencing a list price in a table that no longer exists. So that's just a matter of refactoring, that list price as a column is now found within the product table. And we're back on track. All right, so one-to-one. -one. Yes, you can do it, but the recommendation is keep the number of tables as few as possible. Now, there's another opportunity for consolidation. And when we see that there are two or more tables for a single dimension, when you think about it, product, category, subcategory, product, they all belong to the one family. It just so happened, though, that they came from different formats, Excel and CSV. So I just followed what the data was, and I just presented them as separate tables. In data warehouse terminology, we'd call this a snowflake dimension. Okay, we could keep it this way, but the side effect of doing so is that there's a clear hierarchy from category to subcategory to product. And personally, I like to declare these in my model because it makes it easy for report authors to know there's an opportunity to drill down and drill up, and therefore use matrices, use tree maps to support that exploration experience. A hierarchy, however, its levels can be based on columns that come only from a single table. So having products spanning across tables isn't going to work. So I'll take the opportunity to do the same thing, return to Power Query, come to my product, and merge in the product subcategory. This time relating subcategory to subcategory, introducing category, and then disabling the load on the subcategory. And in my opinion, that's a much nicer model. Look at this, we have a single product table expressing all related fields to products. And then it gives me that opportunity to do this. Right-click category, create a hierarchy, name the hierarchy products. I'm not sure why this is in an advanced group. Pretty much the levels of a hierarchy is pretty staple. <laughs> but it's here that I come and introduce that I want subcategory as the second level, product as the lower level, apply the changes, that can only be achieved because all of the columns came from a single table. The next thing to notice in the model is that sale also has a ship date. So there are two dates that are recorded against a sale. When was it ordered? Another relationship to the date table. Another relationship to the date table. Another relationship to the date table. And what you'll see is that 
Power BI Desktop's happy to create that relationship, but it looks different. And what you see visually is the active versus inactive property. The solid line is active, that is a default propagation. The dashed line is inactive. It's only active if an expression engages it. All right. So what we could do is play with this a little. We can come back to the report and say, OK, if I manage relationships here and I turn off the active flag for the order date and I make the ship date active, what's going to happen? And now you see a different propagation taking place. Those months are filtering sail by ship date, and we're seeing summarization at this level. And let me put that back. The challenge we then have is that there can only be one active path between two tables, and therefore it's one or the other, which could be a little frustrating if you need to visualize what was ordered and shipped at the same time. So one approach to solve this, let me flick them back to order date. And by the way, I would take the opportunity to come to my date table and its properties and make this super clear in a description. Filters sale by order date because those that are using your model don't actually see the filter propagation. And because it's a generically named table date, it's left for guessing, really. And so the tooltip there is going to make that clear to anybody that uh, if I filter by the date table itself, then it is filtering by order date. Now, what I can do is create a measure, as is the case here, called sale shipped. And I just want you to notice the use of the use relationship function where in the calculate, where I'm modifying filter context for the evaluation of this measure, I'm forcing it to use a different, and in this case, the inactive relationship. So I'll go ahead, add a new measure to the sale table, bring this in, and now it is possible side by side to then see what was ordered and what was shipped. But that approach could be tedious, especially if you have lots of dates, order date, due date, ship date, invoice date and so on, that you're going to have to create all of these measure variants based on all of those possibilities. So when it comes to what we call in data warehousing a role-playing dimension, that date sometimes means order date, sometimes means ship date and so on, the approach that you can take is you really should create an explicit table for it. Now, it'd be great if there was a copy and paste feature for a table, and there isn't. Um, the modeling technique is that you will create a calculated table in the same way that this date table was created, but this time, when I create the ship date table, the way that you create a clone is just make it equal the other table. Any valid table expression will work. The name of a table is a table. So now I have a direct clone, and I'd recommend when you do this approach, you should rename the columns as well so they're descriptive. We have ship date, we have ship year, and we have ship month. And then you probably guessed where we're heading with this. And let's not forget, mark this as a date table. Is that we're now going to have two active relationships based on two different tables. And this will support simultaneous filtering by order date and by ship date, enabling me to produce this type of visualization. All right, let's do a stacked column. Uh, what I'd like to show is the order month and the ship month and what we sold. Uh, and there we go. Not so exciting. And first of all, it's sorting not in a way I'd like. Go and sort by month in ascending order. But if you have a look at the legend, you can see what was ordered in January, February was actually shipped in February, and what was ordered in March actually shipped in March, and so on. And we could perhaps make this a little more interesting by bringing in some more data. Let's have a look. Let's go ahead and create another order, but it's shipped in May, and another order, and it's shipped in June. Go ahead and save and refresh the data. Let's see what it looks like. That would only be possible because we have two separate tables with active relationships. So I have found in my model design that while I've got the possibility to define inactive relationships, I more often than not do this. I have models that have over 15 date tables <laughs> due to all the variations on date you have. Okay, so it'll afford you the most flexibility. 
All right, so that deals with the active versus inactive discussion. The next discussion is to explore that we've got some additional data that I need to enhance this model with. So let me come back to Power Query because I've got some sales target data. And I want you to notice what this data looks like. So we have the three columns. The targets, and this is very common, are at a higher level to the fact detail of the actual sales themselves. We have a month, we have a subcategory target, we don't bother to go to individual product, it's just too tedious. So what we've now got is an interesting situation because we won't have a clear one-to-many pattern anymore. Let me describe. Uh, first of all, I wanna point out that month, if you look at the source data, month was actually text, but it converted it automatically, it detected a pattern there, and, and I'll keep it as date. And really my focus is on subcategory. Subcategory will have duplicate values in this column. So let's go ahead and add it to the model, see what happens. There we've got sale target coming in. So now we have two stars. And by the way, while I won't demonstrate it, a newer capability is that you can create multiple diagrams now. And the recommendation is that you'll create a diagram per star. So it's sort of easy to see each fact table and its related dimension tables. Okay, so to establish relationships, let me take the date column and interestingly, let me relate that to month. Remember that Power Query converted it to a date. And it's detected a one to many there. We just wanna be careful, however, that really that date represents a full month period, not really a single day. The target is for the month and therefore the date represents the first date of the month period. Because my date table doesn't go down to date level, it's year, month, well, actually it does go down to date level, we just wanna be careful how you present that data. Don't present it that you must achieve quota on the 1st of March, but for the next 30 days you can relax and do nothing. It doesn't mean that, all right? So just be careful the way you present that. But here's where the interesting part comes, because subcategory, as we should appreciate, is not a unique column. There are multiple products that are assigned to the same subcategory, so we'll have duplicates here. And of course, we have multiple targets for the same subcategory. So what's going to happen when I relate this to this? And you'll see that we've got this window. It didn't automatically create the relationship, but it's really drawing our attention to this yellow box that says, ah, there's something you really should need, you, you should know. But yes, you can see the cardinality has been detected as many to many, but it might not produce the result you expect. I've got to say, I'm not terribly happy with the wording here. It really doesn't make a great deal of sense to me and I sort of know what I'm doing. And so I might click on learn more and I'm somewhat disappointed that uh, it does take me to some documentation but rather generic documentation on many to many. It doesn't really address the issue that might be confronting you. So now is the opportunity in this session to really describe what it's telling you. We're gonna go ahead and say, that's okay. I am gonna switch the cross filter direction. So you'll notice here that the cross filter directions earlier were single or both. In a one to many arrangement, it will always be from the one to the many side and optionally you can have it go backwards. But in a many to many arrangement, you have three options. That it is gonna be both or it's from one of the many sides only. And when you think about it, it really should propagate from the dimension type table. In this case, it's the product table. We shouldn't push filters back from a fact table to a dimension. So I'm going to configure that, that it's a single direction from product that will filter sales target. And I'm not sure why it turned this off, but yes, I want an active relationship between product and sales target. And there you see it. We have now, and this is relatively new, the ability to define a many to many. But let's understand the potential problems with this. So I'll go ahead and create a new report page and then I'm going to bring in that I would like to see month and subcategory. And there we go, see all subcategories for all month. And then we'll take a look at the order quantity or the, sh the sale quantity compared to the target quantity. And does that make sense to us? Okay, the sale activity is very low. Someone set very high targets. 
But at this stage, it, uh, it should make sense. We can see that in January 2019, you're supposed to sell 510, and so far you've sold one. Not a problem. But herein lies the problem with this many-to-many -many arrangement, is that what would happen if you do a grouping on the product table that is beneath the granularity of that many-to-many -many relationship? In this case, instead of having subcategory, we bring in product. Can you see any problem with this? Is the target wrong? Well, here's the issue. If you see on the right-hand side, there are actually four rows representing January 2019. And if you were to sum them together, it'll come to double what the left-hand side is saying. It's technically not wrong, but it's open to easy misinterpretation. This is the problem. There's a many-to-many -many relationship going on between products and subcategories. So what is technically happening is that because we're now grouping by a product, what it does is it determines what are the subcategories for that product and then propagates the subcategories. So if you're going to use a beneath the grain, you're going to be open to this type of problem. All right, so does this mean we shouldn't do this? The solution in the past, by the way, would have been we would have sacrificed our product's hierarchy. We would have kept the subcategory table separate because that gave us a unique column. We had a unique subcategory that we could have joined down to sell target, but we couldn't have had a hierarchy, but that was a small price to pay to get the propagation to work correctly. Now that we do have the many-to-many, -many, it enables us to join, or rather, to relate a dimension to a fact at a higher level than the dimensions grain. Okay, but we must take care, and that's what that yellow box was attempting to say. All right, so what we could do is control the way that target quantity was actually reported. Instead of just letting them summarize a column, you know, I'll come into my snippets here, and I've got a measure here that just does something fancy. That providing the product isn't in scope, you can go ahead and sum it, otherwise return blank. It'd be safer not to show you a target if you're at a product level. All right, so it's where your fancy uh, DAX work will need to come in. So I'll add to sale target a new measure. Providing product is not in scope, so we'll see that we do not see a sale target in this situation, but in the original table, if I remove the column and place in target, you will see it. Okay, so it might require some DAX work, excuse me, to get that to behave in a way that doesn't open up misinterpretation of the data. So yes, many-to-many -many is a cool thing as a cardinality. Reserve it only for dimensions relating at a higher grain. Awesome. Well, let's have a play around with this. So what we haven't yet covered is the concept of bi-directional filtering. And I'll remind you that we saw that you could only create an active path between two tables, but let's see what would happen if I did this. Let's allow filter propagation to work in both directions here and here. And you'll see that I'm prohibited from doing this. I've introduced ambiguity into the relationship scheme, and therefore there is no deterministic way that we could propagate the filters, because there's like a circular reference going on. So you won't be able to do that, which is a good thing. And in fact, what we found is that when bidirectional filtering became available, and let me restore it, um, it was being misused. Uh, it was being used because if you're familiar with pivot tables in Excel that have slices, and depending on your filter context, the slice would actually eliminate options that measures didn't return values for, which was uh, enormously useful. That if I filter by calendar year 2019, in the slicer, only show me the products who actually sold in 2019. And so by using bidirectional filtering, you could achieve that, but at great cost. All right, it's actually a lot more effort for Power BI to handle that, especially as data volumes grow, you might see performance degradation. Uh, and the other thing is it can open up um, other problems with calculations. So the bidirectional filtering should be used, in my opinion, in very specific circumstances, which is what I'm about to describe. Okay, so understand that the capability is there and that it should be used in very specific circumstances, which is the many-to-many -many arrangement that differs from what I just did. That many-to-many, -many, as I'll remind you, was from a higher grain where you've got a many-to-many -many between different dimensions. Recall, managers and subcategories have a relationship. They are different dimensions. The appropriate design approach is to introduce, in data warehouse terminology, a factless fact table. Who is the manager? What is the subcategory? 
and then achieve one-to-many relationships across it. So let me show you how this could work. Back to Power Query. Recall that I have my raw manager data here. I now need to add a table to the model that will give me the combination of managers and subcategories. So I'll create a reference query here, rename it as manager subcategory. Uh, and then, well, well, I need my manager key, so I'm gonna have to merge back to manager. Relate first name and last name to first name and last name, and bring in that surrogate key. Then, I can just keep these two columns, remove the others, and there is my factless fact table. It's not a dimension, but it's describing relationships between two dimensions. All right, let's load this into the model. Okay, so manager is down here and subcategory is here. We have a many and we have a many. What I need to achieve this in the most efficient way is one to many's, one to many's, one to many's. So I'm still missing a table which gives me a one side for subcategory. So I could do this in Power Query, but let me just show you, I could also do it in DAX. I'm going to create a table called distinct subcategory which just equals, guess what? We have a distinct function of the product subcategory column. There we go, there are two subcategories. There's our one side. So I'll just position this table to about there. And then we'll just build up these relationships, many to one, many to one, many, many to one. This diagram is a little flaky. Many to one. Many to one. What did I say about circular references? Do we have a circular reference at this stage? How would we answer that question? Well, let's think about it this way. Um, I will build up a table here that says, just show me manager and sales. Now remember, there are two associations. Managers are assigned to a sale because they physically did the sale. And managers are measured by their performance based on the subcategories they're associated with. So what am I seeing here? <coughs> Angus and B. The way to answer that question is this. Coming to the diagram here, there is a filter on this table and we see that it does propagate to sale but it also propagates to manager subcategory, but this is where it falls down. There is no filter propagation going any further, so it, it is understood that that is the manager and the sale that they've made. Would I be able to make this both directions and allow that filter to propagate over the factless fact table? And it might surprise you, but yes, I can. And at a glance, this is non-deterministic now. Which way is manager going? It can filter sale directly, or it can filter this table to this table to this table to this table, and I'm surprised that we're allowed to do it, but we are. I don't know why. But if we come back to the report, I'm not sure how good your memory is. Uh, the fact is that the result hasn't changed, so the rule that I would come up with is the shortest hop. But is that one that you wanna rely on? It might be a future update and somebody at Microsoft changes the logic and all of a sudden it uses the other path to resolve and therefore you're seeing the sales assigned to the subcategories that the manager is assigned to. So I don't think you should ever rely on the fact that this may break in the future. Um, so to be absolutely sure on this, you know, I would suggest that you create explicit measures. So let's take a look at how this would work. On the sale table, I'll create a measure and here's the use of the use relationship function. Definitely use the relationship between the manager and sale table. That's explicitly declared. All right, so with confidence, I can come to my table now and say, I don't want that sale amount column anymore. I'm going to use the measure, and we know the path that it's going to take. And the other approach is for the manager sale performance. This is a different type of analysis for the manager. This time, the measure is using the cross filter function. Um, so you can actually disable relation. There might be an active relationship, but the cross filter function will allow you to say, change its filter from single to both or to none. 
do not even use that relationship. So let's see what happens when I use this function. And now what we're seeing is a very different result. The second one is resolving via the associations of managers to subcategories to their products down to the sales themselves. But when you really stop and think about it, it's sort of maybe fun in theory, but I would not design the model this way. When you see the example of date as a role-playing dimension, that sometimes it means order date, sometimes it means ship date, manager is no different in this situation. Manager sometimes means the manager that is responsible for the sale versus the manager whose performance is being measured by sales of subcategories. It's really a role-playing arrangement. Okay, so while you'll get away with this ambiguity, you know, really in the real world is you shouldn't have this happening. You might get away with it, but especially when you're using bi-directional filtering, you should ensure that your dimensions terminate. They do not come back and join another dimension. Would be probably a good sound practice. In which case, what we could do, because I think that might have broken things. Do you see that no filter propagation is now happening? We're seeing that all managers see the same performance. We have another function called treat as here. So what I could do is update the measure to say, whatever filters are being applied to the manager table, push them to the manager subcategory table at the same time. So I'll take that manager sales performance and I'll update it to use the treat as function. Whatever the manager key filters are on manager, apply them to the manager subcategory manager key. And then we're back. Wow. Okay, how are we doing? Yep, okay, well that's pretty much everything, isn't it? Have I missed anything? We've got all the cardinalities in there, one to many, many to one. We got rid of the one to one. We've talked about many to many, but when it's a many to many between two different dimensions, we should go for the one to many's across a factless fact table, which will provide you far better performance. Okay, well let's switch back to the slide deck. And that was all about good modeling. All right, so let's wrap up with what matters, what is good, what is not. So let's take a look at these topics. Modeling, strive to follow applicable star schema design practices. So if anyone's familiar with Ralph Kimball and his publications, the Data Warehouse Toolkit, there's a remarkable amount of good knowledge in there that applies to good tabular design. I don't like the idea that a table is both a dimension and fact table at the same time. I like the idea that dimensions are there for filtering and grouping and my facts on the many side are there for summarization. We saw the concept of surrogate keys, that where you do have multiple columns providing uniqueness, you will have to add a surrogate key. Snowflake dimensions like product and subcategory, if you need those hierarchies, probably best to consolidate them. Role-playing dimensions. Well, you could go for the inactive path, but generally speaking, the flexibility comes by having multiple tables with active relationships. Junk dimensions, I won't go through them now, but you might find that topic useful in your design. Of course, measures, having those columns in fact tables for summarization. And we did see a factless fact table associating managers to their subcategories. Table considerations. Fewer tables can improve the performance and friendliness of your model. Avoid one-to-one -one cardinality and consider consolidating where possible. When it comes to active versus inactive, yes, you can do this, but if you're going to have inactive relationships, then you're going to have to explicitly invoke those relationships through formula. Do take care, as I did in the date dimension, to use tooltips to communicate what filter propagation will happen. If you have a generic somewhere, somewhere, whether it's documentation or a tooltip, somewhere, whether it's documentation or a tooltip, somewhere, whether it's documentation or a tooltip, what filter propagation to order date, et cetera, is about to happen. Many to many relationships. Well, the fact is there's really two variants of this. And I sort of refer to them as a type one, type two, but that's a Peter Myers definition. There's no such documentation. We've seen that there is a cardinality property of the relationship that supports a many to many. And I'm gonna suggest that that is useful for dimension to fact when the dimension cannot offer a unique column to reference across to the fact, i.e. our sales targets are at subcategory level, but subcategory is not unique in either table. Where it's two dimensions like managers and subcategories, we'll go for the factless fact table and get the many to one, one to many's happening, and that's 
the use case for a bi-directional filter to allow the propagation of filters to propagate over the factless fact table. So the details about relating facts at higher grain is that yes, you can use what's known as a weak relationship, the many-to-many -many cardinality, but do take super care ensuring that your users don't go and use lower grain columns to filter across that many-to-many -many relationship. And measures and explicit formulas might help you saving bad things happening. As we saw with the relationship between two dimensions, create that factless fact table and have multiple one-to-manys with a bi-directional filter somewhere in there. And you're typically going to go, and I didn't do it, but you would hide those tables. They're there to support the relationship configuration. You do not want report authors or Q&A to have access to them. Bi-directional filtering. Well, this was just covered. While you can do it, please don't do it to achieve that I want my slices to reflect where values exist for measures. All right. Yes, we love it in Excel. Um, I do believe uh, that it's a much asked for capability that the slicer should be able to filter by a measure. Only show me products where this measure is not blank. Let's see what happens. Um, do be careful with bi-directional filtering. If you're using row-level security, you have to go to the extra step of saying, also use the bi-directional filtering for row-level security enforcement. That is off by default. You would need to turn that on, but of course you would test your row-level security rigorously. When it doesn't achieve what you need it to achieve, it's possible that you have not turned on that option to propagate during row-level security enforcement. One thing that we didn't look at is data integrity. And I did make mention that the relationships in Power BI aren't really concerned with referential integrity. Uh, but let's take a look at what happens when we've got missing values. So back here, what would happen is, and this is an expected case when you think about it, that we sold something in May, but you know what, it hasn't yet shipped. We have a blank ship date. What does that mean in the report? Is that an integrity issue? Well, not when you think about it, it's quite reasonable. So when you see that there's a missing or a blank on the many side, so long as it makes sense, like the order date probably shouldn't be blank when you think about it, but ship date will be blank until such point in time that shipment has happened. On the many side, that's okay, but realize what, what Power BI does is it pushes a blank row on the one side, which is a good thing. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to ask the question and visualize what is the volume of sales that have yet to be shipped. Okay, so you would filter on blank on the product side to get this. But what would it mean if we had the other way around? And we could achieve this by just creating a product that doesn't exist. It's actually SN-04, and if I save this and refresh, and let's take a look at it from a product perspective. Show me products and sales. What is it doing? Um, show items with no data. Do I have that product? <laughs> My intention is that we don't. There we go. When you've got that arrangement, that's a data integrity issue. You've sold a product that you haven't declared. You should not have blanks on the one side. Go back to Power Query, go back to the data, fix it. Uh, you do have a property that allows the load to fail. I could come in here and say, all right, stock keeping unit in the sale table, it is not nullable. By turning that property off, the refresh would fail. You're ensuring that there are values. There we go. All right, almost there. That's the concept of data integrity. And I've just said, try and avoid that. On the many side, it might make sense that we don't have a value yet, but on the one side, it really shouldn't happen. Direct query model, a quick last word. Um, the only difference in direct query is that there is a property that says, will it assume referential integrity? That if it has to join multiple tables, if there is referential integrity being enforced, it will use a more efficient inner join than otherwise an outer join. So where you know it's declared in the source, go ahead and check that property. And then for composite models, um, I don't have a lot of experience in this, but because you're blending the worlds of import and direct query, 
many-to-many um, -many relationships must be enforced between the imported data and other data that is in direct query. All right. We're pretty much arrived at the end of the session, sort of on time. So I hope this opens your eyes to the potentials of good modeling and what relationships do and how they can be configured to achieve what your data needs to express. So thank you very much for your time, your interest and attendance. <laughs> thank you, I'll just say that I've got one workshop this afternoon. I know it's during the power hour, which is awesome, don't miss it, but if you get locked out of there, uh, one o'clock, there's a workshop, two hours, the computers are provided, we go through modeling, some calculations. Uh, I understand that registrations are full, but if you get there and there's a seat, I think you're welcome to it. Thank you. <laughs>